Darius says, I don't know if this is extreme pettiness or emotional terrorism. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell, today we're discussing Atlanta season four, episode two, The Homeliest Little Horse. Or was it The Little Homeliest Horse? Whichever way it goes, all I do know is that this episode gave us more questions and answers, but we're gonna get into it. One thing I did love is we got an answer to an age old question we've had since season one, episode one, what happened with Princeton. As we go through this episode, if you guys have watched my reviews before, what we do over here is go through one plot line and then the next, because they flip flop and it gets a little confusing. So we're gonna start off with Lisa's plot line since she's the first one that hits the screen. Opening scene, she says hi to a man and he doesn't even acknowledge her. Then she goes inside with Gizmo, which is such a cute name for a pet. It always perplexes me when people name their pets people names, like when 50 named his dog Oprah. That was just disrespectful. <laughs> She's listening to Sierra Ooh Baby throwback and the track is not missed on me. It really does speak to the character's maturity. Cause I'm thinking, girl, how old are you? Especially when she goes into her room and it's giving teeny bopper vibes. But before we get into her room, She's playing a peeping Tom, looking at homeboy take off his shirt across the ways. I think this whole scene was a throwback to one of the reoccurring themes from season one, two, and three on people who consume the culture but are not for the culture, especially as we get to know the plot Lisa plays. I wanna know if it's just me, but initially I thought this was gonna be another anthology. I love those one-offs from season three. I know a lot of you guys hated them. I thought it was such an artful way of speaking on the culture without the four main character cast. I know I love me some Van Ern, Alan Darius, but some of the stories that they covered last season couldn't have been covered any other way than the way they did it. And some of my favorite episodes were from the ones that had none of our characters in it. So I was kind of excited, but then when Ern came on, I wasn't mad either. I was listening to love songs, R&B, and watching the mandem across the ways. Then she gets an email that says, hey, I want to meet with you about your manuscript. The next scene is Tracy playing a receptionist, back turned, doing as Tracy do. Nice to see you again, reoccurring cast. He's talking about $400 to switch a flight. I said, that's your first indication of how the stories intertwine. I fell out when he turns around, he's just pointing her to sit down. And the way he calls her up when it's time to see Gordon. So unprofessional, Tracy. Did you guys think it was sus too when Gordon was super short with Lisa, but also super eager to sign her and become the agent? I said something isn't right, but I also don't know because I'm not trying to be a literary over here. So maybe that's how it goes. Let me know if you know anyone who has or if you are trying to get a book published. Are people really like that? I love how they threw in the little line about the Bernstein or Bernstein bears because that's been a conversation for years. Which way does it go? Who knows? But I love those books growing up. I was laughing when Gordon said, do something about them grays, okay? <laughs> Next scene is Lisa meeting with her bestie, Becca, who doesn't seem as enthused as a best friend should. We find out as they're speaking that Becca can't afford to lend Lisa 500 again this month. That's a lot of money to give a friend. Do you lend your friends money? It's a very dangerous track to tread. Lisa gets upset by this, but I'm kind of confused because I understand where Becca's coming from. I lent you $500. You're telling me how you quit your job because you got this opportunity. How about you run me that money back? How about you work a little bit if you need to get your PR, your hair did, your nails done, friend you been fired yet. All this stuff costs money and quitting seems a little, again, it's playing into the childishness of her room being decorated that way and listening to Sierra Love songs. Something about this woman is not quite right and I can't put my finger on it. This next scene is really where I put two and two together. Some girl quit her job. Why is this lining up with what's going on with Ern? But we'll get to that. It really gets solidified when she goes to the library and the librarian is not having her and her service dog says, I don't care about your paperwork. The dog can't come in here. Lisa again prompts her to the paperwork and then she drops the key that ties her into Ern's story that she works at the airport and this is the proper paperwork. The librarian still doesn't care, says you can tie your dog out there. <laughs> and you know she loves this dog. I don't know if it's really a service dog, but I know a lot of people play that way. When I used to work at a restaurant back in the day, people would always say, yeah, it's I'm just like, really? Really? Because you're ruining it for the people who actually need dogs, like blind people or people with anxiety, but story for another day. The agent that's supposed to sign her is sitting in the back and getting secondhand embarrassment from these kids roasting her. Gordon warned her though, he did say, inner city kids. And if you don't know, 
I worked with inner city kids before. At-risk kids are ruthless. Kids in general, but at-risk kids, they don't business. They're going to tell you like it is. And I was crying when she's reading the story, which wasn't bad, by the way. And these kids were roasting her. Oh, the horse is ugly. The story is boring. The horse is farting. You can tell that she's crumbling, especially as the person who's supposed to sign her gets up and walks away. Her dreams are slipping through her fingers. And then we realize that the last person there, even the guitarist gets up, is a girl sleeping on the floor. Alana always takes things to the next level for no reason. She seems like she's going to cry. The scene pans out and she's actually on a screen and we see how this intertwines. Let's go back to Ern's plot line. So we see Ern in a car getting a phone call from Al about his AIM password. Talk about a throwback. Atlanta always brings us back to the early tech days with the way they intertwine CD players and iPods and conversations like this into their scenes. I was laughing so hard when they were talking about AOL. What was your AOL name? I never had that. My mom wouldn't let me, but some of my early email names were just bad. They kind of relate when they were talking about the password and they said Scarface. No, no, no. It was middle school, Mulan. Al would be the one to love Mulan. That's a good movie. It's top four up there with Lilo and Stitch, Little Mermaid, and Aladdin. What's your Disney pick? <laughs> Al had some kind of nerve, though, because just before he goes, he starts to make fun and mock Earn for going to therapy. Oh, you rich, rich. That really speaks to the culture and the way they view seeking out help. A lot of times when you tell someone from the culture about getting therapy, it's kind of like this faux pas thing where it's like, why? You can talk to your friends for free. And a lot of people who I've recommended therapy to have said the same thing to me. And in all honesty, the first couple sessions feel that way. I'll keep it real with you. But it's essential to go through and see if it is the right thing for you. It may not be. Therapy is not for everybody. But I think it's worth a try because we all have traumas and triggers. And Earn is a perfect demonstration of this. By the end of the conversation, I'm like, Al, you need therapy just as much as Earn. We saw you in episode eight of season three, crumbling as Lorraine's embodiment was telling you about yourself. <sighs> All of these characters need therapy. Maybe not Darius because he's remained constant, but maybe he needs it too. Who knows? We know Van does from episode 10. We definitely know that Al does, and we find out why Ern does too. It was real royal of Al to roast Ern. It always is the person who needs it that's going to come for you. Ern's in his session, but he's not in his session, if you know what I mean. He's getting distracted. His arms are folded. He's very closed off. He even fixes himself to tell the therapist, well, these notifications are the reason why I can pay for these sessions. I know those sessions are expensive because you see that layout? That therapist costs big coin. But you can tell that he cares throughout the sessions and he's really present. I liked how they showed not only this therapist style, but the evolution of going to therapy and how it takes several sessions to get to the crooks of a problem. It wasn't a, what's the word? It wasn't a romanticized view of what it's like to go to therapy. And the funniest part to me was when he said, can I lie down? I thought it was going to be that typical TV lying down on the couch talking about your problem scene. But he lied down on the floor to let the blood flow go to his head, which really spoke to him acknowledging where he's at. So before that happened, we realize a lot. He's moving up in the world. He's thinking about going to L.A. When Tillman, his therapist, asks, how is things at home? He talks about his condo renovation. Sir, he didn't ask you that. People do that all the time. They sidestep and swerve the question because they don't want to sit with themselves. This scene and the episode in its entirety was about sitting with yourself and where you're at. What I loved was that it finally Ern says, you know, I'm worried about Van and Lottie coming with me to LA as I become a creative consultant. Things are good. I can't complain, but I do have chest pains and the doctor isn't taking it seriously. This really speaks to countless stories about People of the culture, especially black women, who have been neglected when they talk about their pain and how medical professionals are actually trained and taught, studies show, to not acknowledge when we complain about pain the same way other ethnicities do. You can Google it. It's not missed on me that they slipped in the Kim Porter comment since she is someone that 
if you want to get into it, you can talk about it. Could it have been avoided? Was there neglect in play? But her aside, there's countless people every day who have stories of going to the hospital, whether in the States or Canada, about a problem, and then kind of been brushed to the side about their condition. It was good to see when he lifted his shirt that he had the EKG machine, is that what it's called? But it was scary to see when he was talking, he was rubbing this side of his shoulder. That was a moment. I was just like, hold up, sir. Maybe you need to go to the doctor, not this office. Isn't that a sign of stroke or seizures? I don't know which one, but either one is not a good thing. Tillman said that this is the physical embodiment of stress. A lot of times we don't realize how much pressure we put on ourselves and how it is expressed in our body. It's not just how we show up emotionally, but physically too. And I want this to be a reminder for you to tap into you and your body. The next session I almost mistook as a continuation of the first until I realized he was wearing a different shirt. I was so excited. You should have seen me. I was like this as they were getting into Princeton. I was like, we need to know what really went down. At first, Ernest talking about the keyboard and it seems like he's deflecting. A lot of people do that. I've been guilty of doing that, especially when I first started going to therapy because I went shortly after my dad passed away. I didn't want to really face how I felt about certain things. So I'd start talking about how are you and the but a good therapist will talk about it, you know, play into it a little bit. That's the kindness, but bring it back to you because after all, you're paying for it. This is when we find out the age old question of why Ern didn't finish Princeton. When I heard this story, I said, wait, 0 100 real quick. It really became that big thing. Unfortunately, that's how it is in real life, though. I like that they didn't make this this big movie explanation where it was just something that could have happened. Seems like a gross exaggeration for the action. But at the same time, when you know what life is like as a black person, and as he said, one of 12, it could happen. I almost thought it was a real story. You know how Alana likes to put those in? but I didn't see anything that related to real life. So if you found something, let me know. I was watching these scenes thinking, this is the first time that we've seen Earn emotional. After getting to know this character over the last couple of years, and after as much as he's experienced, we haven't seen him break down. And I thought it was gonna be a breakthrough, but as we get to know, homework. He's got a lot of homework to do. So we find out that Al got close with another RA named Sasha and she swindled the situation. I don't know if she was jealous because he went out with someone else the night before, which why were you going to a party the night before an interview? I mean, he was in university and we've all done stupid ish. But what I couldn't really gel with, I was thinking when he was retelling the story is that's why his parents said he was too expensive. They lent him 500 for the suit and he was styling. When Tillman threw that in, I said, sir, you're really doing the most as a therapist, but okay, go off. I was thinking about expectations again, which they spoke about in last week's episode and how you never really know why someone moves and operates the way they do. And sometimes people don't even know it too. We realized by the connection, that therapist is a dot connector, the connections that he made that Sasha was merely a trigger for past trauma with earned family. I thought that was breathtaking to see on the screen because it's not touched on enough and it's very realistic. A lot of times I realize in my own sessions, damn, that's really that. Who would have guessed? And it really helps you inform yourself better in real life. And that's what it's about. You can do whatever you want in the 60 or 50 minutes you have with your therapist. But if you don't put it into practice in real life, you're wasting your money. This scene symbolized a lot to me as they talked about spite and how Earn became the man he needed to be based on the shortcomings and life not working out the way he wanted to. It's also a lot of troublesome truth in there when he said, well, I don't know if I'm gonna go speak at this thing because they want me because I'm black and the donations. I'm thinking, sir, why you wanna go there? Go where you're celebrated, not tolerated, but sometimes you have to decide, is it better to go somewhere and symbolize something or by not going symbolize something else? It was good in that moment that Tillman picked up the undercurrent of anger and resentment and even regret. Something that I don't think Ern would have been able to sit with himself, but a good therapist will lead you. Sometimes I felt like Tillman was guiding him too much. Just my personal preference. How do you feel about that? He's very assertive with his therapy style. Two other things that really stood out in the scene was when Tillman got up to offer the tissue, Ern rejected it, but they just sat there in the truth of the moment and it was beautiful for what it was. It also really exemplified to me picking the right therapist who you can say things without saying things. Sometimes I thought 
Tillman was doing too much when he was like, oh, she was white. Oh, this. I'm like, sir, why you have to add sauce to everything? Let Earn get to that conclusion himself. But in a way, it demonstrated the importance of having a consultant that is the same culture as you. My therapist is Caribbean too, and I think having the same ethnicity really helps you bridge the gap. And you don't find yourself wasting precious minutes and coins explaining why something is the way it is because they just get it. And it also juxtaposes perfectly with the character Lisa who's consuming the culture but isn't of the culture, someone who's in the mix, who's had situations in the past with people like Sasha, which triggers him with Lisa because he hasn't dealt with the original trauma of his family. The bigger question is, is it a bad thing when your pain propels you to your purpose or when it propels you to pettiness as we see in the end? So the third session, he comes in, a little pep in his step. He gets a gift from Tillman, which is so sweet and thoughtful. He lies on the pillow and he's talking about how he didn't end up going because some chick at the airport wasn't having his wrinkly passport. But I also noticed that he was talking about his desires to go to Sesame Place with Lottie and Van. I thought, sir, you dodged a bullet because I don't know if you heard a couple months ago, they don't acknowledge kids like Lottie anyway. And I don't know if you want to waste your money there. But hey, this is an indication that he's trying to be a family man. And maybe he's angry that that fell through. Or maybe he's angry that the decision was made for him as far as Princeton goes by another white woman who has an obvious bias. I thought it was funny when Tillman's like, was she white? Oh, really? You asked the black lady and she said, I was like, sir, you're enjoying the conversation too much. It needed to be said for the point of the story so that we knew without a doubt that another person working at the airport who was black acknowledged that this happened before with this person. It wasn't just a one off or it wasn't that he suspected it and he tried to be the best he could be in the moment and it didn't work out for him. And speaking on expectations and things not going according to plan. At the end, he's like, you know what? I have the tools I need. Thank you for this, but I'm going to hold that therapy. I held my breath for a second. Something said to me, this is too soon. He's not ready yet. But as a good therapist does, they let you go and let you take the floor pillow too. I thought the therapist, when he closed the door, is like, you'll be back soon. I don't know if the therapist could see through Earn or if Earn's lying to himself so well that the therapist couldn't tell, but I hope to see the therapist again. I mean... Sullivan doesn't look bad, just saying. Back on track, the stories collide when we see the screen pan out at a party that Ern is planning and he reveals that he paid for everybody from the kids to the guitarist to Gordon to Tracy who Al does not have any interest in acknowledging. You saw that, right? I love when Darius says, I don't know if this is extreme pettiness or emotional terrorism. That's a good ass question. Is he psycho? Or petty, which one pick one? I think a little bit of both. But what we do know is that Ern acknowledges at the end by himself at the bar after everyone walks away, he's alone and he says to himself, I need to go back to therapy. Yes, you do. The biggest theme of this episode, the undercurrent and the overarching theme was spite and whether or not it's a good or bad thing and how it can propel you to stupidness like we saw or push you forward as we've seen in the last couple seasons with earned character development. I know we've all had moments, don't lie, where we've done something we know we shouldn't have done. Maybe not to this extent, maybe not trying to be karma for karma's sake, but it was really watch, <laughs> it was hilarious watching the end credits and seeing Lisa with the dog. It's like, this is over the top, but it really spoke to not just regret or revenge, but what is your purpose and the why and the intent? And I think because we talk about this so much on my podcast, if you want to check it out, it's on Patreon. It really gets to the root of the why of people and their behavior. And I hope that we get to see more of this unfold as we get to the next episodes. I wonder what your predictions are. So leave them for me down below. I don't really, this could go any way. I'm just hoping that Ern gets himself right before the end of this season and series. And maybe now Al can see why Ern has been going to therapy. <laughs> it was funny, but not for the right reasons. I give this episode a four out of five stars. I love that they talked about therapy. If there wasn't that bit, it'd probably be a three for me because the extent of pettiness was high level. But anyways, I want to hear your thoughts. You know where to leave them. Until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.